Hello everyone webinar about making meaning clearer verbally and visually. This is Sophie, I'm the Professional Development Manager at English Australia and I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Claire McGrath. Claire is a freelance teacher trainer and ELT consultant and some of you may know Claire from the many years where she worked at ATIS and then Navitas Teaching and Learning on the CELTA and DELTA training courses and also providing in-service PD programs. Thanks so much for coming to present today, Claire. You're very welcome. Just checking that uh, everyone understands that this is being recorded and giving everyone a big welcome whether you're here currently. It's great to see so many people and to those also who are listening to the recording in the future. So let's get started. As you can see, we're talking about making meaning clearer, not necessarily uh, talking about establishing meaning, but moving on beyond that checking understanding, using different means, questions and tasks for vocabulary and shall we say structures, including their timelines. So the aim of this is to support teachers who are relatively new to English language teaching while they build awareness of language and confidence with this. I would like to say thank you to lots of colleagues from ATIC and various other places where I've worked, all the trainees and teachers and the students. Uh, I've got a couple of names and links at the end, but um, including I'd like to mention Julianto Luquito and Nina Cascado from International House. Um, I've been working with them recently and having some interesting conversations with them and other people on those ELT. So let's go. I'm just going to get control of the mouse again, so it is not working. Hold steady. Okay, Sophie, um, I'm struggling to control the slides here. Brilliant start. Here we go. Here we go. It's just taking a moment to kick in. While um, we're waiting for that, um, if you want to take photos of the screens or take screenshots, whatever, that's fine. But of course, the recording's available and the slides with the notes will be too. Now, you can see we're talking about going deeper into meaning and not tearing the wings off the butterfly. There is a difference, of course, between pinning a butterfly down to study it, but accidentally damaging it in the process compared to studying butterflies in the wild, so to speak, or at least here, language in a well-designed, constructed habitat, as well as authentic samples. And as people develop confidence and awareness, you know, their approach becomes increasingly subtle. I do think though there is a point with students where particularly lower level students, we need to help them come to grips with language when they're learning about something perhaps for the first time or looking at meanings as expressed through um, more than just one form. And let me say, when I use the word form, I mean, you know, the parts, the bits and pieces, the names of the structures, etc. When they're delving into things a little bit more deeply, comparing similar ways to express meaning or different ways to express the same meaning. You can see very much that when we're speaking, we're using language that we're choosing in a particular context. So trying to help them understand the reasons for those choices. You can imagine um, when you're working with slightly higher levels, students are able to respond a little bit better they have a larger bank of samples of language in use in their minds that they can draw on and they're more aware of why a certain choice has been made. And that is one very good reason why, for example, we wouldn't ask students, what does this mean or can we say X, Y, Z in English? Is it correct to say X, Y, Z here? As competent users of uh, language, we can run that sample through our mental bank and higher level students can as well to see if it comes up with a match and work out why something is or isn't correct. But when you're starting out in ELT, you know you know why, because you're running it through your mental bank and, um, sorry, you know what you'd say, but not why, because you're running it through your mental bank and seeing a match with, yes, I would say that in this context, or I wouldn't, but students can't do that. So we will be exploring questions uh, that we can use with students and tasks. Now, of course, there are a range of approaches to working with language, a range of beliefs about uh, different structures that we use and different strategies we use. My aim here is just building on confidence and awareness of teachers. 
so that when they're looking at their course books, they can think how to exploit those or how to create their own materials and ultimately just building on students' uh, knowledge, providing them with the right degree of challenge. So at different times, we have a few tasks. Here, it's just for you to be thinking about the choice. When we speak, we have choices. So we need to explore those. Why do we say this? Who are we speaking to, where and when? So some examples here, in the context of someone asking their flatmate about tomorrow to avoid um, hold-ups accessing the bathroom, what would you say? Which ones are you most likely to choose? Which ones are you less likely to choose? For example, I think I'd be less likely to say, what time do you get up tomorrow, that first one, if I'm talking to my flatmate? Whereas I might choose some of the others, one of the others. If you change the context, then the choices change. For example, in this one here, yeah, I might use that present simple for a future scheduled arrangement because of that particular context. There's even choices that you're making in the uh, vocabulary surrounding this. So for example, what verb you use here, depending on who you're talking to, what the context is, so for example, recently there were a lot of pe people queuing outside that new cosmetics shop in the QVB and I don't think they were thinking this in the same poetic vein as Yates was when he wrote that. So the overview here, looking at making meaning clearer, you can see my general focus here, where we're hoping to go. And it's possibly a bit ambitious, covering quite a meaty topic. Uh, anytime you attempt to pull a lot of samples of language together, there are lots of different perspectives that impinge and some many, many strong opinions from people out there. I would like, however, to spend a little bit more time on the structures because the timelines, I think, are something worthwhile getting our heads around. So as you go, you might be thinking about ways you could uh, use the course book, adding a meeting supplementing what you're doing, thinking about authentic speech. Um, there are a couple of extras in the slides, but I definitely want to have time for comments and questions from everyone. So going on to have a look at the process, whether it's with vocabulary or structures, tenses, situational functional language models, whatever, I think the process is fairly similar when you're preparing for language you're not yet so confident about. Thinking about your approach, whether you're establishing, clarifying, checking, correcting. You generally start thinking about, well, what's the context? Who am I saying this to? And looking at the context of the example utterances, you know, who is the speaker or the writer in your course book materials? Who are they saying it to? Where, when, why? Imagining yourself saying it, I think, is, is really handy to help you unpack the meaning. And then, of course, checking in various sources, dictionaries, grammar reference books, and colleagues. Thinking about where's the tricky point for the students with this, what will cause confusion, and then having established your groundwork with your data, then thinking how can I simplify that for language grading purposes so students can understand, and then using questions or tasks with students to help make the meaning clearer. And also it's worth planning what your expected answers are, or what the expected answers from the students are, what their likely responses to the task will be, just to cross check that they match. So we're gonna have a look at some examples now of questions and task checking, understanding of meaning with vocab. And as we go, just um, perhaps consider the different types of questions or tasks. For example, um, here, one example, showing the difference where you're dealing with, say, a library, you, you've used a picture to clarify the meaning and you want to back it up with a question about where's the nearest library, just to help them memorise that as they're acquiring this word. So a WH question versus, say, you're listening to some students talking about a library, so you, you haven't got an image to hand, you know they're French speakers and there's a bit of confusion between the meaning of a library versus a bookshop. And so you might ask a question 
in order to help them to self-correct because they've made the wrong choice of word based on first language interference. So thinking about different types of questions, here's one example with the coast. You've got your definition, it needs simplifying there and you prepare some questions. So as you look at the questions, just choose one or two of them. Which do you like? Which would your students respond to? And if you want, you could write the number in the chat box. I'm not able to see the chat box, but Sophie's keeping an eye on it. If you want to type one of those numbers, if you were gonna choose those, you might choose the first and the second, maybe the first and the third, the first and the fourth. And noticing the different types of questions, that first one, you've got an A or B choice question. Number two, there's a yes, no question. Number three, a task. And also number four. So possible problems, yes, of course, that fourth one there, maybe they're from a landlocked country, but that's a good opportunity then to clarify the difference between say the coast and the border. So another example, this time not with a noun, but with a verb. And the point that I want to make with this is that you don't want to go overboard. So out of those four questions, which two might you choose? And there you've got some yes, no questions, a task, an A or B choice question, or an A or B or both question. The point here is perhaps considering choosing number one and number two or number one and number four, but not going overboard, not asking too many questions. So being very selective. Another example now with an adjective in the context of movies, a famous producer's movies or a famous director's movies being listed in chronological order. And the point here is just emphasizing the need to get to the point quickly. So again, some questions and just choose which ones just one this time, which one do you think would be the most effective? And perhaps you might be thinking number two, maybe number three or number four. You could add a task instead of those questions, giving them some films if they know those films to put them in chronological order. The problem of course there, it may require expert knowledge they don't have and your time checking dates. And um, they could guess, it might be a bit of quick random fun um, perhaps with something that's a bit more obvious and easier to guess. I'm not sure I could put the Star Wars films in chronological order, but perhaps some um, theories or paintings <laughs> or something like that. Um, even just finding the film by name or famous person or film with X famous star in it and which was their first by chronological order. Okay, we're going to um, finish by looking at some possible problems in questions. So thinking about those two words in italics or phrases, spectacular and get rid of something. Some examples of questions that might be asked and the potential problems there. So on the left, those questions are not tightly focused on meaning. The first is not really going to help. It might be interesting personalising that, but the others really aren't going to help. They're not focused on meaning. The ones on the right, you can see using more complex language, overly formal, overly complex, or too colloquial for the students to be able to respond quickly enough for your purpose and for theirs. So we'll just um, think briefly about a way of checking backwards if you look at the questions and think what the answers are to see if they're easy if your questions are easily answerable so what are the answers for these questions and can you guess what the target language is should be reasonably obvious it's used in the first question so imagine you were using giving someone a hand with the housework as your target example and you've already established the meaning with some pictures and paraphrasing. So just cross-checking that your questions are answerable and noticing that first question using a slightly different but related context. And did you come up with these answers?
So the point there was just making sure that your questions are answerable and similarly that your tasks are achievable. And one last point, if you are dealing with, let me just go back for a moment, here we go. Uh, if you're dealing with this out of those questions, any comments, any thoughts about those questions? And you might think, okay, having very clearly established the meaning of banana, those first three are really absolutely not necessary. The fourth one's just very confusing and not helpful. And the other ones similarly, not worth asking. So do think carefully about the questions that you ask, what's gonna be most helpful for students or not. Okay, so a bit of a review of the design and the range of the questions and the tasks that we've asked already. And just regaining control of the mouse, if you'll give me a moment. You might want to um, stop and think what range of questions have been asked while I attempt to move on to the next slide. Yep, Sophie, I can't move on. It's changed for some reason. In these circumstances, trying to use the mouse or the arrows. Ah, here we go. Back in business. Thank you. Okay, you might have um, recalled those types of questions and also the types of tasks where students are doing something physical or they're making a choice or finding something, uh, working out which one's the odd one out or even connecting. So for example, you've got a larger set of items and they have to make connections between two out of that set of items that helps show that they have understood. But I, I think it's worth noticing, unless you and your students really know each other well, unless they're of a high enough level asking those questions on the right, are not very helpful. The first two, because it takes time for the students to respond. They've got to draw together their information. They've got to get the language they need uh, to express that clearly. And the next two, when you ask those questions, you often don't get much of a response or you get a response, but uh, they say yes and you still are not perfectly sure if they're just saying yes to appease you or they think they're right, but actually they're wrong. So perhaps uh, considering not asking those questions. Even uh, asking students, do you have any questions? Perhaps better question there might be, what questions do you have? Just opening up the possibility that they can ask questions. Uh, we'll finish looking at Vocab by just thinking about the sources of images. The icons I've used in this uh, are free, copyright free from flat icon. And lots of other sources in Creative Commons. Um, but be careful, make sure you do use context when you're searching, particularly off the cuff in class. I'm about to show you an example of an image I showed a class who were working with an American English text where um, it was a, a recipe and they were talking about shredded cheese. So I thought, oh, I'll just jump on and Google shredded and show them immediately what that word means, but I didn't use the word cheese. And so uh, I'm sure to this day those students remember what they saw next, which was the image of, if you can predict, and we've lost control again, but there we go. Rather embarrassing, but very memorable. Okay, now, just got to go back a little bit because we've jumped ahead. Now we're moving into structures and I think this is very helpful in the early days for people to get their head around the patterns in order to be able to name things, to be able to go away and look it up. However, it's very form focused and that's the mo not the most important thing when we're communicating. We're not thinking, oh, I need to use a particular form. So yes, 
it's helpful for you doing research, but not the point um, that you start with with students by any means. So what I want to move into is looking at timelines and questions with students. So there's an, there's an example coming, just showing with that target language there, having established meaning with visuals, very easy. And the idea of using questions as you build the timeline on the board or on the screen. So timelines, very straightforward line moving forward. No need to clutter it up too much with anything other than that time bar and now. There's no need to write past and future, etc. because the more information there is there, the more distracting it can become. We want to keep it simple. So questions related to this one, and you'll see where the timeline visually supports the verbal question. So you've got the question you might ask about every day. However, that should already be fairly obvious, but the fact that he's not at the gym now, you can see that the uh, going to the gym, those X's indicating that it's not actually happening right now. And then backing it up with a little bit of personalization perhaps for them. So that's one example of how to build up the timeline step by step with supporting detail that's reinforcing the question that you're asking or the questions. But keep an eye on the big picture while you're thinking about this. If we look at a couple of different uh, examples here where you've got the same structure but in very clearly different contexts. So same form having different meaning, the classic present continuous for something in progress through now or through a future time. So again, reinforces the need for a very, very clear context, supporting the meaning, laying the ground, but also thinking about laying the ground for the future, not just for this one or other structure or comparison of the two, but laying the ground for looking at the patterns there in the verb ing. So the idea of that verb ing, something being seen as in progress at the time of the context. I think sometimes um, when you look at course books, you'll see some very simplistic examples sometimes and later there, for example, the classic they'll meet first of all, and then later there seems to be a contradiction. So just have to be careful about laying the ground. I do think that squiggly line for the action in progress or the situation in progress that cover, covers the bases. It's not that you're in danger of telling them something that's not true, the old Santa Claus story, and then later they find out what's not true, but it's more like you're peeling off the layers of the onion. I think the context can't be emphasized enough, as you can see from that course book uh, example from Scott Thornbury, she's having a shower compared to his authentic sample of if it's raining, it's a chore to walk the dogs, which seems to break the so-called rules. You've just got to be aware of how you're presenting it to, to students that it's in this context or another. However, let's have a closer look at this issue of what's called aspect of looking back. Thornbury has some examples here. Um, he was talking about patterns, high frequency formulaic expressions. On the left, some where there's an emphasis on something that's ongoing. That squiggly line, continuous, in progress, progressive. And also another issue with aspect, the backward glance. You can see here with the perfects. And this is a really handy thing to introduce to students. That timeline there, now you've got two time bars where there are two times, an earlier one and a later one, but the person using the perfect is sitting there in that second later time and looking back over time to an earlier past time. And that can be very significant. We're going to come up um, with a couple of examples in a moment about that to really help them get around that backward glance angle. If you want to read more about it, there's that link there for um, Thornbury. So he talks about uh, establishing that the ING form in whatever construction it's found is really closely associated with an ongoing activity and the present perfect being a present tense 
um, but with a backward glance. So on that timeline there, if if it was the present perfect, then for the second time bar where the person is, I would put underneath that the word now. But when you look at um, past perfects as well, and future perfects, there's something similar. Someone's either looking back from an earlier, from one past time to an earlier past time, or in the future, looking back from a projected future time back over time before that. I, I just think that image of the person looking back really helps ring bells. I remember uh, a colleague, Gareth Lewis, introducing me to that about 15 or so years ago, and it really uh, rang a lot of bells with me. So a closer look at this retrospective looking back with those two examples. On the left, something that's seen as remote, past and finished in both time and action, and that's important but with no link to now versus the one on the right. It's not remote, as in that's why we're using this present have you and calling it the present perfect as well. For a past and finished action, the reading in an unfinished time up to now. And noticing also the way you can use the timelines. So, for example, that one on the left, really um, your timeline and your concept checking question reinforcing that this time and action is past and finished and not connected to now. Whereas the one on the right, the action might be finished, but it's time up to now because it's connected to now. There's this effect or result or link to now. So if somebody says, have you read my email and you know, what did you think? What have you, you know, what's your response versus just did you get my email? There's no particular connection to the effect or result or link to now, which is an interesting thing to get your head around. But I hope you find that little person looking back helpful. Let's have a look then at some of the elements of timelines. So I'm going to show you some, it, these are timelines about myself, but the, it's not a narrative. It's just in the context of me talking about my teaching career. So these are some timelines. What I want you to do is just notice what are the different elements there? What are the similarities and the differences? And matching them up with some statements about me. So for example, in that first one, using this um, extended X, to show that this is a state permanent, for example, versus the second one, a series of actions. The third one, the squiggly line reinforcing the continuous. And the fourth one with that X in the past, not connected to now. So keeping the timelines relatively simple with a bit of supporting detail, as you can see in the last one, for example, the 1990s. And thinking then about the questions that you would ask based on those. For example, the first one, is this about now or all the time? The second one, is this once or many times? The third one, um, you know, when did it start? For example, you can see it started before now the fact that it's not finished, that it's going to continue into the future. And the last one, questions, for example, is the action finished? Teaching English in Japan. Do I still teach English in Japan? No. And is the time finished? The 1990s are well and truly over. Okay, let's have a closer look at that one about what I'm doing at the moment and see how we can connect the analysis with the questions. So some issues that you'll see come up in various grammar reference books and online blogs about that. This idea of not remote, that it is connected to now and not retrospective, we're not looking back. In progress, unfinished through now, but around now, not necessarily now. So can you imagine what questions might be most effective for you to ask? Thinking back to those different types of questions with vocab, we can apply those as well. For example, asking, when did I start now or before now? Or is it finished or not? Is this now or around now?
Okay, so the principles um, for questions about structures are pretty much the same as they are for vocab. It's in context. We're looking carefully at the concept behind this language in context. We're thinking about the student's existing knowledge. The questions are very focused, so not distracting with irrelevant or confusing items, keeping it simple in surrounding vocab and structures you're using, not cluttering the screen or their minds visually or verbally, having something that's comprehensible as in achievable that supports the meaning. With the vocab questions, I think it's, it's good to have a variety and also with the questions about structures, but um, some more systematic way. Okay. So we're just checking the connection if you're there. And while this is going on, you might want to be thinking of questions that you want to ask. Thank God for Sophie. How are we doing? Yep. Was it your connection or mine? Just make you the presenter. Okay. And the just recordings. Technical, just... Okay, we're having a bit of a technical problem at the moment. We're not sure if it's with Sophie's connection or with mine. But she's attempting to resolve that now. And as I said, if you're still there, if you just want to be thinking about questions you've got, trying to add them to the chat box and we'll try and work out which of us can get access to those. It's like when you're in class with students and something goes wrong, you've got to reload something or find the right website, you need to give students something to do. So if you do have questions about particular structures, you might want to be designing your own checking questions and think uh, about sharing those in the chat box. If you can still hear me, can you type yes into the chat box? Are you getting any yeses? Not right now. Okay, we seem to have dropped out. Okay, Sophie believes that you can still hear me. We're just changing where we're presenting the slides from. And we are looking at that slide there. Okay, so are people down to here? Okay, so hopefully you can still see that. If you can see that, if you wouldn't mind typing into the chat box, you can see that over on the right. You can type yes. So recapping there, those questions WH questions, when did it start? Or you could offer them the choice, whether it's finished or not. And the last one, actually now or around now. Now that last one, it should be completely obvious if you're with the students, it should be pretty obvious that you're not currently working on PD for non-ELT teachers. So you need to be selective. The previous points I was making about context, concept, focus, simplicity, comprehensibility, variety versus a systematic approach to the structural ones. Um, sequence, building up the students' understanding gradually. Sufficiency, in other words, not